Hey what's up everybody, Trophynet here and welcome back to Gwent Edge. In this show we talk about specific Gwent cards or interesting decks to play around with. It's been a while since we talked about the monster faction. My first proper video in this format was actually about the Arakas Queen and the Deadbugs deck, a type of deck that is currently one of the best decks in the game. So check out that video if you want to learn more. But today I want to talk about one of the more neglected leaders in the game. Edidin Break Glass, the leader of the Wild Hunt. He's also the leader in our deck of today, aptly named the Wild Hunt Dominion deck. First things first, let's talk about Eridan's leader ability, because it has changed quite a bit over the course of the last few weeks. Originally, he could boost the unit by 4 and give it immune, making your opponent unable to directly target that unit. If played right, this almost guaranteed you a win on the round you used it on, since you could immune a powerful engine unit. Crimson Curse changed this to boosting a unit by 2 and giving it a shield and allowing Eridan to do this twice. The tutorial update however from last week changed this again by upping the boost to 3, but keeping the shield and the number of charges. So a boost by 3 and a shield. We haven't really talked about shields yet since Crimson Curse came out. So shields negate the next hit of damage a unit would take regardless of the amount of damage after which they are removed. This does not protect that unit from destroy abilities or prohibit your opponent from targeting that unit, so it doesn't protect it from everything. But like that, Aridin's leader ability has stayed the same in spirit. You can use him to protect your most powerful engines from harm, so they can last longer, making him a versatile leader. Let's see how we can benefit from this. In the background you can see today's deck composition right here, it's a mixture of Wild Hunt units and monsters combined with a few organic cards that focus on keeping at least one of your units the highest unit on the field. This way we keep Dominance on our side. Dominance has been added, removed and re-added to the game multiple times now. Similar to Bloodthirst, Dominance improves an existing ability or adds an extra ability to a unit when you control the highest unit on the field. This excludes the unit that Dominance works on however, so if your opponent has a unit that is just below your Dominance unit's power, but above your second highest unit's power, then Dominance will not trigger on that unit. Keep that in mind because it can be important. I've reworked this deck multiple times to see what works and what doesn't, which is why we, hadn't, we didn't have an episode last week, but originally it had a lot more Dominance units than it has now. But I feel like this way it is a lot more viable. Overall the deck plays like a point slam deck, trying to overpower your opponents quickly through sheer numbers, forcing them into an early pass. For your second round we can start using our engine loop, an engine loop we can actually use twice if needed. The card in question is none other than Imlarith. Imlarith can damage an enemy by 1 each turn, which is boosted to 2 if you have dominance. After you've played Dimlerith, you should focus on keeping your dominance, something your opponent will most likely try to counter. You can do this in two ways, either keeping your opponent's units down by damaging their higher units or even destroying them, or you can boost your own units above your opponents. This deck has the tools for both. Damage wise we have quite a few options. Wispess can damage a unit by 2, 4 or 6 damage depending on whether you've played Weavers and Brewers already or not. In our case, I would suggest to play Brewers first, since multiple consumes will be mostly useless aside from making a big unit. The damage and boost you get from the other two witches are more useful tools. Parasite can damage an enemy by 6 or boost an ally by the same amount, which makes it versatile in every situation. Hideous Feast gives you the best of both by damaging a unit by 3 and boosting another by 3 at the same time. The Cyclops can potentially be a high damage dealer if you're willing to sacrifice a high power unit, which is sometimes necessary to take out a strong engine card. Both Rot Fiend and Arcaspore give you some random damage, and don't forget to play Predatory Dive first when you go second in a round, to destroy the first unit your opponent plays without losing anything yourself. Aside from those, we also have our big hitters. Shoop has a wide array of damage possibilities, able to spread out damage or hitting a single target depending on your choice. You don't always know for sure what you'll get with him, so be sure to have a backup plan. Knight is usually the safest bet, almost guaranteeing you 12 points and netting him his highest power at 8 points as well. Geralt can take out a unit with 8 power or higher, perfect to take out a high power unit that you can't damage enough to stay in dominance. And the same goes for Imlarith's Wrath, 
which allows you to damage an enemy by the power of your highest unit. Since you're always building up units, this almost always gives you 8 damage or higher. And don't forget the damage Imlirith himself can dish out. The constant damage output is often enough to keep your opponent's board empty if you can keep Imlirith alive. We've also added Nitral to take out an artifact and potentially damage any adjacent units by 2 if you have dominance. Use him to take out the summoning circle or any other dangerous engine type artifacts your opponent might play. But, on to boosting. Now that we know how to keep the opponent down, we also need to mitigate any damage we receive and keep that dominance going. We've got you covered on that as well. Weavess is the counterpart of Wispess, so she can boost a unit by 2, 4 or 6 depending on the other witches already played. Although Shoop is usually better as a damage dealer, he can also boost units as well, so you'll have to often make a judgement call with him. Grégoire de Gorgon is a new Crimson Curse edition and deals 1 damage to an enemy unit. Not much on its own, but if he kills something with that 1 damage, he boosts himself by 5 and gives himself a shield, netting him 10 points in total. Combine this with the damage you can already do and you can almost always set up an enemy unit to only have 1 power left. As I said before, Parasite and Hideous Feast can both provide some extra boosting as well. To keep the most powerful units on our side of the board, we also add a few extra tactics. We have some Tribe units going on with the Neckers and Wyvern, boosting them by one each time we play a unit with a higher power than them. On top of that, we also have a few consumers, namely Brewers, the Barbagazi and the Seleno Harpy, to quickly create high power units while triggering the Death Wish abilities of the Rothfiend, Bridge Troll and Arcaspore. The variety of this deck also allows you to keep your opponent guessing about the goal of your deck in the early stages of the match when you're just playing bronze cards. But back to the main focus of this deck, keeping Imlarith alive and going. I said before, we can actually play him twice. That's where Karantir comes in. He can create a one power copy from any unit in your hand. If you can, do this with Imlarith. One power is dangerous because you can lose him quickly, but with Eridan's ability you can actually boost that up to 4 and give him a shield, enough to get you started and perfect to set up the first round if you feel you'll need it. If you play Imlirith normally you can boost him up to 8 and add the shield, but that's where the change to Eridan's ability becomes more dangerous. Since his boost from 2 to 3 makes Imlirith an 8 power unit if you use Eridan's ability, it also makes you vulnerable to a few destroy abilities your shield won't catch, such as Geralt or Leo Bonnard. This makes the one power copy actually more likely to survive that first turn when he's on the board. To protect Imrit from death, you can try to play Avalach first. Avalach is actually the only unit left that can immune a unit other than himself, protecting that unit from being targeted, even by direct destroy abilities. Just remember to apply the shield first, and then immune him, because immune also blocks you from targeting that unit for boosts. If any of your Imlirits is locked, you can also use the Peller in this deck to remove that lock. Be mindful that this will also remove the shield if one was applied. These tools, in total, should allow you to protect Imlirith in most situations. As to how you play this deck, try to limit yourself to bronze cards in the first round. If you have Karanthi and Imlirith in your hand, you could play the low power version in the first round, but be careful since that way you tip off your opponent about what you have planned. It's safer to focus on Deathwish, Consume and Thrive units in the first round, with some tactical removal of the more annoying engines your opponent can throw at you. <laughs> Playing two Imlerits in the last round is extremely satisfying, especially if you can keep them alive and trucking on. Since this deck focuses so much on high power units, it is also important to spread out your boosts where possible. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, and be careful to not have your highest units be the same power. If your opponent plays Scorch at that point, or Igni, you will feel it otherwise. With all the possible high power plays, you should also try to take the first round in most cases, especially if your opponent passes with a big advantage. Shoop, Geralt or Grégoire can help you out in that case, you have plenty of other tools to finish up in the last round. And that's it, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Got any other tips on how to play the monster faction or have any ideas to improve the deck? Don't hesitate to leave advice in the comment section down below so we can help each other out a bit. That's what this channel is all about. Any feedback is greatly appreciated. So uh, if you want to talk, check me out on Twitter at @trophynet. And if you've enjoyed this video, why not give it a like? Because any support is really appreciated. 
Thanks enormously for watching, and I hope to see you guys in the next episode of Wentage. Goodbye.